Uh, I now recognize myself for five minutes for questions. Uh, Director Ray, stopping terrorism is the FBI's top investigative priority. On January 6th, the Capitol was overrun by domestic terrorists, and it has been, become clear that the FBI failed to take threats of violence seriously enough before the attack. Director Ray, when you testified before the Judiciary Committee last week, you said, and I quote, aware of online chatter about the potential for violence, but were, quote, not aware that we had any intelligence indicating that hundreds of individuals were going to storm the Capitol itself, end quote. But the threats, I would say, were everywhere. The Norfolk Field FBI office notified your office. The Washington Post and other newspapers were writing about it. It was on radio, it was on television, it was on other social media streams. The system was blinking red. The committee has obtained documents showing that social media company Parler sent the FBI evidence of planned violence in Washington, D.C. on January 6. Parler referred this content to the FBI for investigation over 50 times. And according to the company, quote, even alerted law enforcement to specific threats of violence being planned at the Capitol, end quote. I'd li like to ask about one tip in particular. The committee has obtained an email in which an employee from Parler shared a social media post with an FBI liaison. In that post, a Parler user stated, and I quote, this is not a rally. It's no longer a protest. This is a final stand where we are drawing a red line at Capitol Hill, end quote. The user later said, and I quote, don't be surprised if we take the Capitol building, end quote. The user concluded, Trump needs us to cause chaos to enact the Insurrection Act, end quote. This information was passed to the FBI on January 2nd, Director Ray, were you made aware this email from Parler prior to January 6th, yes or no? Were you aware of this uh, communication from Parler? Well, Maloney, I do not recall uh, hearing about this particular email, uh, certainly not before January 6th. Were you aware of the 50 times that Parler tried to contact your office about an insurrection? Uh, I'm not aware of Parler ever trying to contact my office. Uh, I am aware since January 6th that Parler uh, has made some comments about its communications with the FBI. My understanding is that they send emails to a particular field office and that some of those contain possible threat information and some of them were referred to domestic terrorism squads for follow-up and we've been taking a hard look at the various emails that Parler sent. Uh, to assess the accuracy of their assertions uh, and whether further action is warranted. You also mentioned the You're, Norfolk yeah. report, and I guess I just I, I do want to be clear that that information, uh, raw, unverified information, as unfortunately so much of the information these days is on social media, uh, was quickly passed to all of our partners uh, in three different ways. Uh, almost immediately. So I, I do want to be clear about that particular piece. Well, Director we did over Ray, the course of the period. I'm yeah, sorry. Reclaiming my time. Director Ray, do you know sure. whether the FBI took any action in response, not just to the alarming email, but to the, the national media? The Washington Post reported on it. It was on radio, television. It, it was everywhere. Uh, uh, did you take any reaction to any of these alarming notifications that there was a planned insurrection at, at the White House. Or, no, not well, at the Capitol, at the Capitol. So, a couple things. First, over the course of the period leading up to January 6th, we put out, I think, a dozen or so uh, intelligence products, including two bulletins in particular, uh, specifically raising concerns about domestic violent extremism specifically raising concerns about domestic violent extremism related to the election and specifically related to domestic violent extremism continuing past election day itself 
right on up to the time of the certification and even the inauguration. And that's in addition to some 500 or something uh, field office intelligence products that were pushed out, raw intelligence that were pushed out to our partners uh, along the way. Uh, in addition, but we- Reclaiming my time, Director Ray, yep. do you agree that the FBI shares some blame for the failures on January 6th? Do you take any responsibility for these failures? Uh, Chairwoman, I think the best way for me to answer that question is that our goal is to bat a thousand and anytime there's an attack, much less, much less an attack as horrific and spectacular as what happened on January 6th, we consider that to be unacceptable and we are absolutely determined to make sure that we're doing our part with our partners to make sure it never happens again. So you can be confident. Okay. That, that's that good that you are making that commitment, reclaiming my time. Will you commit to conducting an assessment of what went right and what went wrong at the FBI before January 6th and, and providing this assessment to the public and to the committee? Evaluating how we can do better. I also want to make sure that I don't get in the way of, as you may know, there's a Department of Justice Inspector General review that I think is relevant to this as well. And so I I'm going to be very interested uh, in hearing what the Inspector General. Well, I would so say we'll that uh, the Inspector General uh, has a different role. I think it's very normal to ha assess what went right and what went wrong during a crisis. Uh, we are asking for an assessment. I, I would as assume that you would be doing one. And just yes or no, will you provide us with the assessment to the committee of what went right, what went wrong? And you said you want to make sure this never happens again. What are the steps the FBI are taking that this never does happen again? I think that's we, a very fair and reasonable request. Absolutely. I, there's no, no problem with, uh, with us trying to give you more information about the changes that we're making, the improvements, enhancements we're making to ensure that this doesn't uh, happen again. And, and I, I must uh, conclude by saying that we're very disappointed at the response uh, from the FBI on the document request that we have sent uh, out with five other committee chairmen. We sent it back uh, in March, nearly three months ago. And will you, yes or no, commit today to providing a complete response to these requests by the end of this month? I know that we've been trying to do our part to get you the right information. I know we've produced about 500 or so pages uh, of intelligence products, uh, but I agree that we need to do better and have to move faster. And I've asked my staff to look for ways to expedite the process. Uh, I do want to be clear uh, that it is trickier than it might sound. And the reason for that, which is an important reason that I want the whole committee to understand, is that we are uh, totally immersed right now in making sure that our ongoing investigations and now 500 or so prosecutions to hold accountable the people who assaulted you all go forward uh, and are protected. And so managing the document production while protecting the integrity of those cases with some very strong-willed judges who have very clear views about publicity and things like well, that. Or things document that production manage. is very, we very important. We expect you to comply with it. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocated for the superiority of the white race. That is an absolute flat out lie. It is not our greatest threat. Not once in his speech today did Merrick Garland mention last summer's BLM riots or skyrocketing crime on our streets, the riots we still see week in and week out. How about Merrick Garland? You condemn this man on your screen, Justin Tyran Roberts, arrested for shooting five people in a 20 hour shooting spree in Georgia over the weekend. You know why he did it, according to investigators? They insist he was intentionally targeting white, military-looking men. That sounds racially motivated to me. He didn't mention that. No mention of this black-on-white crime because it doesn't fit their divisive narrative. These are stories that are actually happening in America. How about we stop issuing fake warnings about crime based off of political agendas and start prosecuting all criminals no matter what color they are.
when you're up there, are you just getting tired of being told you're a racist, I'm a racist, everybody watching is a racist? Yeah. They have to talk about January 6th, and they have to talk about things that divide us on, uh, along racial grounds. It is, it is so wrong, but that's who the Democrats are today. They're this radical left-wing party, and they have nothing else positive to talk about, so they have to go here. Yeah. You know, you look at January 6th, everybody has said it was a tragic day, it never should have yep. happened, they wanted people that were violent and destructive put away. But, you know, I was looking at Senator Ron Johnson, he looked at hours and hours and hours of tapes, and he was like something like 40% of the people were just let in by Capitol Police. But they don't talk about any of that, and you have SWAT teams showing up in California at somebody's house, trying to rouse them out of the house for walking around taking selfies inside that Capitol. It isn't right, Congressman. Or how about the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol? I mean, look, you're right. We Republicans have been, conservatives have been consistent. We condemned the violence that took place on January 6th, and we condemned all of it that took place all last summer with all these, uh, in all these metropolitan areas around our, around our great country. The Democrats are the ones who have been hip hypocrites on this. They did, they, last summer was fine. That was a righteous cause. But then they focused on, on January 6th. But the couple in Alaska who weren't even in the Capitol, the FBI kicks in their door, holds them at gunpoint, handcuffs them, interrogates them for four hours. They got the wrong couple. And then they take their phones, their laptop, and their pocket-sized copy of the Constitution. Talk about, I mean, th that, there's got to be irony in that, that, that fact alone. So, yeah, th where's the consistency that we would like from everyone? We've been consistent. I wish the Democrats would do the same. Yeah. Well, there's my pocket constitution. I carry it with me all over the place. <laughs> and I'm in Texas, Congressman. Come and take it. Usually we're talking about guns. This time I'm talking about my constitution. In the FBI's view, the top domestic violent extremist threat comes from racially or ethnically motivated violent extremists, specifically those who advocate for the superiority of the white race. Garland did not provide any numbers or statistics to back up this claim, but pointed to past racially motivated shootings and attacks, as well as the January 6th riot on Capitol Hill. Noticeably, Garland spent his entire 26-minute speech without even mentioning the summer of riots one time, simply ignoring months of attacks on police and federal buildings and cities all across this country as if it just didn't happen. Steve, I think this shows how politicized Biden's DOJ has really become ignoring vi radical violent groups like Antifa, like BLM, simply because they support the left-wing agenda. Yeah, unfortunately, it's another example of two sets of rules or two sets of narratives, really, in a way. And the narrative being spread here, of course, is that that January 6th is, uh, was a, a riot that somehow endangered the American Republic, which is not in any sense true. It was an unarmed riot, inexcusable for, to be sure, but unarmed. No, not one person has been charged with having a firearm inside the Capitol that day, and it lasted a few hours. To try to compare that to weeks of rage and carnage ap across the summer last year in 2020 um, is just totally ludicrous and illogical. Unfortunately, that's right where Merrick Garland went. They're essentially pitting Americans against one another by labeling it ba via basically a race war, which is essentially what they're implying with that statement. And I don't agree with it. And I think it's absolutely horrifying to see that you have the DOG, DOJ essentially being weaponized against the American people. There was, a, there was a rally in Chicago of white supremacists on January 25th. And they put out a national call and they got 80 people to show up in Chicago. And according to one expert, five people were from the Chicago area. Out of about, what, eight or nine million people who live in Chicago, there were five people, right? And so a lot of this uh, the southern, the, relies on the Southern Poverty Law Center and the statistics that they put out and the media regurgitate that. And so I think we have to be careful. Certainly, I, I do not trust the media uh, on this issue because they, they have proven themselves to be uh, you know, not reliable when it comes to being partisan and pushing certain narratives. So um, is white supremacy, is there some in the United States? Absolutely. Is it the most, uh, biggest threat to, to America? I think that's overblown. And I think that the administration is pushing it for their own political reasons. You know, it seems to me that race relations in America in recent decades have improved so dramatically that things like, for example, interracial marriages are totally unremarkable in America today. Uh, and it is not considered acceptable in polite society at all to have racist views. And yet we have people like Garland and Joe Biden who want to insist that the country is systemically racist. Are they essentially protesting a struggle that has already been won in American culture? You know, there has been tremendous progress in this country. And, and for a lot of folks, 
uh, on the left to, to, as they're saying now, this is, you know, voting rights, it's Jim Crow 2.0, that there's been no progress made since the 1960s or even the 1860s. I mean, that is, most Americans understand that's ludicrous. I mean, that is gaslighting, right? That is an absolute gaslighting right. of the American people. And so I think, uh, again, in our normal everyday lives, we do not see the bogeymen that are being made out. There are not Klansmen walking around the corner. There are not white supremacists uh, gathering on street corners. And so I think, uh, you know, that ultimately falls flat to the American people because that's not what we see and we live in our day-to-day -day lives. Right. And we understand that racism is really, uh, you know, has, has been a thing of the past. I mean, does it still exist today? Sure it does in certain areas. But is the, is the country systemically racist and oppressive? I don't think most people believe that.